My grandfather immigrated to Canada in 1923. He left school in grade 11 uh, to work as an office boy at Avid Laboratories. However, by the end of his career, he was the Canadian president of Avid Laboratories and twice uh, president of the Canadian Pharmaceutical Association. An amazing achievement in such a complex industry for someone with no formal education. In his retirement, he moved from uh, Quebec to Nova Scotia. Uh, as a business student at, a, at nearby Acadia University, I'd often visit my grandfather. And you'd think that someone who had achieved so much in the business world would be able to offer me profound advice to help me in my own studies. That advice, the secret to business, he'd often say to me, I was leaning in, ready to take notes. It's about the people. Hmm. In all honesty, I felt a little disappointed at that advice. I didn't feel like it was an answer to my next upcoming midterm, nor had any of my professors uh, raised this issue as something of that critical importance. So at the time, I discounted the advice and focused on my debits and credits. Now, my grandfather sadly passed away in 2002, and at the time, I was working as a financial model jockey at uh, Mira and hadn't given his words of wisdom much second thought. I was master of the debits, credits, and all things financial. It wasn't until 2006 when I left Amira to go work with George Armoyan and his private equity fund did his wisdom suddenly seem so relevant. What had made me successful in the first half of my career suddenly felt like it was not enough. The first investment George had me work on was Fishery Products International. It's been a few years since this company was around, but at that time it was a Newfoundland headquartered company with about $900 million in sales with zero profit. George had invested with John Risley back in 2000 uh, when the plan was for Clearwater to merge with FBI to create a global seafood giant. And for six years, the premier at the time had been dead set against this idea and did everything in his power to block it, including changing the law twice to block the merger and subsequently an income trust spinoff. So tonight I'm going to discuss this story and to discuss some of the variation between uh, theory and practice. George gets involved with a lot of turnaround situations of small public companies, which makes for wonderful experiments for me to test some of my ideas. Now, these are companies that don't have uh, vast resources to dedicate to hiring seasoned veterans or hiring consultants to tell us what we do. No, we tend to hire young, ambitious people, figure stuff out for ourselves, and promote from within whenever we can. My first lesson during my career transition happened early. I began my FBI assignment working with the president of the U.S. division, which accounted for about half of FBI sales, and he had me convinced that we had a strategy problem. He believed the key strategic issue was whether FBI should continue promoting a brand, which is very expensive, by the way, or it should co-pack for private labels and let them spend the money on the branding. I was wringing my hands. I was going to model this all the way to the Grand Bank because that's my thing, building complex models. However, upon hearing this, George said to me, listen, Blair, you are going in the right direction with this. This company may have a strategy issue, but it's the execution that's killing them more right now. The situation was the more seafood this company was selling, the more money it was losing. So I refocused to first unravel this mysterious lack of profitability. I spent the next few months learning the business from the ground up and arrived at the conclusion that the biggest problem we had at FBI was that it was full throttle and broken brakes. It became clear to me that the sales organization was disproportionately driving this train. The sales teams were constantly coming up with new ways to promote sales through complex schemes. Schemes that the rest of the organization and our systems couldn't keep up with. For instance, our invoices were more often wrong than they were right. As a sales-driven organization, there was a belief that bending over to please our customers was the key to creating value, not inconsistent with what you'll read in many marketing textbooks. However, without functioning breaks, our customers abused us worse than a Cinderella stepsister. We agreed to BOGO sales events, buy one, get one, to get our products on the shelves of big retail customers. But as soon as those BOGO events were over, these customers delisted our products. We created unique menu items for some of our special food service customers. And then these same special customers turned around and hung us with the excess inventory when it didn't sell through. 
We accommodated customers who requested last minute orders, sometimes shipping a pallet or two on a truck across the nation. We lost money each and every time we did these sorts of things. At the heart of every issue, the finance function should have been standing up and saying, hey, this doesn't make sense, but they didn't. They couldn't because the sales guys were miles ahead of them, adding on new business before the back office even knew what was going on. The throttle was overpowering the brakes. I wrote George a memo uh, I called 101 Things Wrong at FBI, in which pertained to this lack of uh, braking function. Uh, this memo actually led to my appointment as the CFO of the U.S. Division, and I summarized my turnaround plan into a three-stage maturity model. Stage one is what I call the compliance level. It recognizes that finance may be on the same train as the rest of the organization, but is lagging the rest of the organization. Work is getting done, but barely so, and in most cases on the backs of a few key individuals. Level one compliance is exhausting because all you feel like you are trying to do is to catch up, but never do. You never see what's coming. Finance only sees things after the fact. Also consider, if there are new surprises or excuses every month as to why profits were off or reports aren't available or why they are inaccurate, then you can't provide control for the business. I did a lot of hoping and praying in the, in the early days of becoming CFO. I didn't have complete confidence in the finance function. So level one is not a whole lot of fun. Stage two is what I call the center of excellence. At this stage, you've got a full complement of staff to fulfill your mandate. Finance is now moving together with the rest of the organization. A passenger, if you will, perhaps even in first class. The reporting systems deliver credible external reporting and insightful internal reporting. The finance function is fully supporting the execution of the existing business. Now, generally speaking, riding with a finance function, performing at a level one is short-sighted. Yet many small businesses and distressed businesses we get ourselves involved with run their finance departments this way. Most often, the logic being is that finance department is nothing more than another cost center to manage. However, once you begin breaking that perception, it still takes a year or two to move from a level one to a level two with a concerted effort. So what could be possibly left for stage three? Stage three is what I call world-class finance. It's audacious. It's a state where the CFO is working with the CEO at the front of the train in the strategic pursuit of growth. In level three, the CFO changes the perception of finance from one as a cost center to one as a value creation partner. Others in the organization seek out the advice of those in finance to make better decisions. We are proactively managing capital allocation, minimizing our cost of capital to pursue even more opportunities. Our reporting systems evolve into real-time systems with real-time performance indicators, allowing us to be even more responsive. Finance provides visibility into the future. Achieving level three is not like flipping a switch and waking up someday realizing, hey, I know how to drive a train. A level three finance function takes years to achieve, but I like the idea of throwing it out there to capture the imagination of people, even if they're presently riding in the caboose. So lesson number one is to first make sure your brakes are the same size as your throttle. There's no point in adding another engine if you have no ability to control it. Having two functions that challenge each other, sales and finance, make for better decisions. Let's drill further into the people aspect of finance transformation. What I learned during the first six months at FBI was that no matter how good my ideas were, no matter how much passion I had, I couldn't implement change alone. I suddenly needed people. I had the board of directors and they provided wonderful air cover, but that was only half of what I needed to reach my destination. I also needed a crew inside the organization to buy in and help out, which is much harder to obtain when you're asking them to do things differently or work harder. The biggest difference between being a CFO or a corporate director for that matter is the amount of time we spend on the people. Our business programs and our professional designations do a wonderful job of building our financial expertise, which predominate the first half of our career. However, in the second half of our career, we need to retool. Executive competencies such as leadership, team building, coaching, communication play a much more prominent role in our day to day.
One skill is having the ability to distinguish between good people and right people and devise ways to close this gap using recruitment and training. The right person in the sense of the role you need them to play to execute strategy and act on your ideas. There's a world of difference and George would always ask what I thought of all the people I was meeting. And in the early days, sometimes I got this assessment right and sometimes I gave the individual more credit than I should have, which in the end slowed down the transformation. Beginning in 2006 and, and continuing today, I've been working on developing a competency map for the finance function. A competency is a definition of what you can do. It includes both what you know as well as your ability to apply it. Technical competencies address your gap, your finance, your tax. Enabling competencies further refine those personal attributes expected of each member in such areas as personal productivity, teamwork and leadership, business acumen, etc. The competency map defines proficiency for each role and of the entire finance function. And the first application of a competency map is for job design and recruitment. Next, by assessing your staff against this map, you can determine and support where you have existing strengths and weaknesses in your team, which feed into your assessment of the maturity model. So back at FPI, as a result of this assessment, it became clear with all the craziness going on that my controller was unable to fulfill all the competencies attributed to a controller role. This actually resulted in me hiring a second controller as an experiment. Confusing? Yes. Unorthodox? Absolutely. Does it work? Yeah, it works. When you need an extra pair of hands to transform a finance function from a level one to a level two. The competency map also allows you to develop individual and group development plans. In Boston, one of my team competency gaps I identified was that the finance team didn't understand the business, making it that much harder to get the accounting right, let alone provide insight on the numbers. So each week I would organize speakers to come in over lunch and talk about various aspects of the business. The idea of using a competency map to help plan and manage your staff continues to evolve. I've begun talking about it more in my CFO leadership program, and the idea seems to resonate with participants who have been looking for a tool to put their foot against. A tool to help them apply best practices and, and to broaden the view of what finance can offer, which justifies a request for resources. I was on a call recently with some folks at Proformina, the world's largest uh, website for senior financial people. I made the comment that they should consider organizing their website around a competency framework. And once again, this idea struck a chord and now I'm working on a project with Proformative to take this idea to a much bigger scale. Individuals and their managers will complete a competency assessment and the website will configure content based on this assessment. So this idea continues to gather momentum and I'm quite excited by this. But there's still an element missing before people will fall into line. Principles of persuasion would suggest that you need to make a credible appeal to both the emotional mind and the logical mind. Believe it or not, the logical mind doesn't influence behavior nearly as much as the emotional mind. To reach your staff's emotions and change their behaviors, you need to build personal relationships, coach them along, and set emotional context. During many of the sessions I present, I poll participants, and I observe that very few organizations or leaders know how to use these concepts in a way that drives performance. I believe mission, vision, and value statements are above all else an emotional connection amongst your people. When you're in the turnaround business, you really need to cut through all the BS rather quickly. You rarely hear George talk about mission, vision, or value, or use that terminology. However, George is extremely good at conveying these concepts through any conversation. It's part of his charm, though it scares the crap out of some people. George stood up at a town hall meeting in Boston in front of the entire staff, expressed the words, listen, if you guys don't want to adopt our suggestions, there's a saying that goes, some things are better dead than they are alive. I think George was just trying to convey to everybody an investor's perspective. We could have doubled the stock price just by liquidating the company. Now, I don't go recommend throwing these kind of words around casually unless you're in the mood for rebuilding your organization from the ground up. Mass resignations ensued, but this resulted in one pile of promotions and a flood of new ideas which got our turnaround jump started. 
On a flight to Boston, I tried the kinder, more gentler approach of writing a mission statement for my finance team, which I've adapted in my CFO role since. A mission statement specifies the purpose of the organization, or in this case, the finance function. The act of committing it to paper, or having the words haunt the organization as George's did, is intended to bring focus and avoid mixed messages. Our goal is to get control over the water cooler conversation, which typically arises when people don't know what's going on or what is going on is inconsistent with what they've been told. My mission statement summarized the key points I wanted to emphasize with my staff. I laced it with enough superlatives in an attempt to establish an emotional accountability. Each person on the finance team should have felt something familiar and personally relevant, and this was entirely by design. As a team, we discussed what the meaning of the key words and phrases you see underlined. For instance, credible. Credible means we are honest and forthcoming, and our advice and insights are backed up with analysis. For me, I like having a foolproof mechanism to support implementation. So besides living these words myself, I incorporated them into the performance evaluation process. And in doing so, staff and their supervisors are triggered to document examples of employees demonstrating competency, fulfilling the mission, or living the values, or perhaps not. These sorts of mechanisms help retain the people you want while helping those not as well aligned to realize for themselves that they are either not right for the position or they need to improve. So what became of FPI? The company was broken up and sold off as a going concern with the U.S. division being acquired by Highliner in 2007. With only half of my 101 items list addressed, the value of our investment tripled. And in the year and a half that George and I were involved, uh, we made an exit. So in part, I believe there's a return on moving the finance function from level one to level two just by focusing in on execution. But I haven't even told you the best part of this story yet. Let me tell you about a director of food service at FBI in 2006. George liked this guy from the start and promoted him to VP sales and then to co-president within eight months of getting involved. Today, Keith Decker is now the president and chief operating officer of Highliner Foods, the acquirer of the FBI business. It turns out Keith had some serious latent executive skills that George was the first to recognize and once identified wasn't afraid to give the top job to someone who a few months earlier was buried in middle management. Equally as impressive is the Highliner stock chart since 2008. Highliner has been really successful in now addressing the strategic issues of the business. Highliner has been consolidating the U.S. seafood industry for the past six years. This was only possible because despite his sales background, Keith focuses on all lines of a set of financial statements and not just sales. As the finance function moves beyond level two and becomes a strategic partner in the pursuit of growth, the returns can be enormous. So stepping back and thinking more about the second half of my career, it turns out my grandfather had it right all along. It is about the people. Transforming the finance function to the next level requires you to consider first getting the right size of brakes in place to complement the size of the throttle. And I believe there's a return on investment in, in a functioning set of brakes. Second, using a competency map to distinguish and develop the right people from the good people. And third, making an emotional appeal to your people to get buy-in and build alignment. When you combine these three elements into your own staff management practices, you have created a formal and structured mechanism for ensuring the right conversations are always taking place. We all want to manage our staff more efficiently, and, the, and your payback for investing your time in your people will be that you now have a plan for development, You're, you'll likely notice that you have a greater staff commitment, uh, and leading to higher levels of staff productivity. And you can now support a request for the resources to break that narrow view of what finance offers to an organization. If you're a senior financial professional, I know you want to make a valuable level three contribution to your organization. And it's about the people to get you to that stage. Thank you for watching this video. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear from you. So please feel free to contact me. That's all for now. Bye.